Who is Jesus? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, with the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Well, hey guys, uh, what a privilege it is to spend some moments together again today. It's uh, always a joy to spend some time with my brothers and sisters around the Word of God. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've really been praying for wisdom in these days. These are unique days. We've never been here before. Uh, in one of the genealogy records, uh, as they record uh, some of the, uh, the great heroes of the faith and the genealogies of the 12 patriarchs, one of those passages that talks about the sons of Issachar. And it says of the sons of Issachar that the sons of Issachar understood the times and they knew what to do. They understood the times and they knew what to do. And I've been praying that God would make me a son of Issachar in this season, that I might understand clearly what's going on. What is, what is transpiring here? What, what is, uh, what's everybody carrying? What's everybody walking with? What are some of the hurts and wounds that uh, people are experiencing out of this? And what are the, some of the needs and challenges people are facing out of this that I might understand and that I might find from him what to do? I, I would covet you, your prayers in my accomplishing that as well. Well, hey, guys. As, uh, as we've been spending some time together here on Sunday morning, we've been looking at uh, the book of Colossians. Here a couple of weeks ago, we began a, a journey through the book of Colossians, a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the, to the believers at Colossae, a church he had never visited, a church he did not plan. In fact, Colossae was planted by Epaphras, uh, a man that the Apostle Paul had led to Christ. And uh, Epaphras returned home to uh, that region and there he planted a church at Colossae and Hierapolis and at Laodicea and they had some notable influence in the first century uh, as a result of that. And the Apostle Paul, having heard about this, is writing them a letter being concerned that they might understand uh, the truths of discipleship, how to be true and genuine followers of Jesus. And so he writes a, a letter to them to speak to them about being in Christ, what it means to be in Christ, what Christ has done on our behalf that we might be in Christ. Christ and how that uh, practically lives out in our everyday life. And so it's a, it's a very, uh, uh, it's a marvelous book that talks to us about the excellence of Christ. And it's a marvelous book that talks to us uh, about how to live that out in our daily experience. Uh, the first week we uh, looked at this, that Jesus, the, the Apostle Paul wrote and he said, I heard about you. Man, I've heard about you. I've heard about your faith and love and hope. He says, I, I, I've heard this about you believers at Colossae, that you're people of faith. Do you just dare to believe God and trust God and know God? And you ex exhibit faith in everything you are and everything you do. And, and that you are loving, that you, you, you the love the brethren. And, and that you evidence, you evidence hope everywhere you go. And you know that those are the character traits that should be evidenced in every believer's life. That we should be people who walk in faith, not fear. That we should be people who love and are known for how well we love our God and love one another. And that we have hope. That we know this is not all there is and we have an eternal hope. Well, last week we looked at this. Last week we looked at this, that, uh, that prayer changes things. And the Apostle Paul uh, continued his letter to the believers at Colossae. And he said, I'm praying for you, man. I'm praying that you might be uh, filled with the knowledge of God. And I'm praying that you might walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him. 
He says, I, I'm praying that you might be full of the knowledge of God in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. He says, I'm praying that you might understand the great principles of God and know how they live out in daily life. And I'm praying that you might walk worthy, that you might walk worthy. And we decide, man, that's, that's startling. But, but he defines that for us with four participial phrases. He says that if you're going to walk worthy, if you're going to be fully pleasing to him, then, then this is what's going to be happening. You're going to be bearing fruit. You're going to be growing in knowledge. Uh, you are going to be in the process of being strengthened by God and you're always going to be giving thanks. Here now in verse 15 this morning, all of a sudden as the Apostle Paul is having this dialogue with the believers at Colossae, there's this great interruption, this great start, uh, this great stop, if you will, as he begins to speak to us of something about that is urgent that we've got to hear. He, he plants in here a a first century hymn that we've got to hear that extols and exalts Jesus for who he is. Now, all of us have had moments in conversation where you've been talking with someone and, and someone starts saying something and you realize they don't have all the information. And, and you want to interject that. It's, it's urgent to interject that because they're going to say something they're going to regret. They're going to say or make an assumption that, that is built on, on uh, inadequate information. And so you say, what, 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 what? And, and you try to interrupt and you try to get that in because it's critical that they have all of the information required. The Apostle Paul interjects here these incredible statements about what it means to be in Christ, who Christ is. And uh, I, I, wanna, I, I want us to drill down on that and see what that means for us. We're going to find this, that the Apostle Paul talks to us about Jesus. He, man, he is the Lord of creation. He's the Lord of redemption. And as a result of that, it impacts who we are. Uh, let's, uh, let me invite you to follow along as we read Colossians chapter 1. We're going to begin reading in verse 15, and we're going to look at this great hymn of the faith and its great impact in our lives. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds... He has now reconciled in his body a flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister." The Apostle Paul begins telling us that Jesus is the Lord of creation. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the Father, the image of the invisible God. He breaks into song in the midst of this writing. So he's been writing to the believers and suddenly we're in a hymn of the faith of the first century. In verses 15 through 20, we hear this great hymn of the faith that extols the person of Christ and who he is. It's a hymn in two stanzas. It's a hymn that is introduced in verse 15 and verse 18 with, a, with a, a Greek phrase, who is, who is the image of the invisible God, who is the head of the body, the church. And so he talks to us about this reality that Jesus is the Lord of creation and Jesus is the Lord of the recreation, the Lord of redemption in our hearts and in our lives. He begins by telling us this, that Jesus is, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the, the image. The word image here is the Greek word icon, icon. It was used in the first century, uh, in first century Greek of a soldier who wrote a, a letter home to his father and enclosed a small portrait of himself. It was called an iconion, an iconion. It was a small image of who he was painted for his father to have. It was used in the first century in uh, legal parlance. If you entered into a contract or you had an IOU, 
you, you would have an icon, an icon that was a, a legal description that was very detailed of both parties involved so that they could be identified. It was used in Matthew chapter 20 verse 22 of the image of a king that was imprinted on coinage. It was the icon of the king or the image of the king. Uh, the idea here is that Jesus is the portrait of God painted for man. That Jesus is the portrait of God revealed to mankind. The very nature and character of God revealed through him, the invisible, became visible to those of us who are struggling to understand. The invisible became vis visible that we might understand the character and the nature of our God. He is the authentic likeness of God. We have no further need of visions or of prophecies. We have the exact and full representation of God before us. No one needs to ask what's God really like. We know what God's really like. It is revealed for us through His Son. The Colossians had teachers who were coming in and adding to them traditions and rituals and things that would enable them to understand more about God and comprehend more about God. And the reality of what the Apostle Paul is saying is if, if you want to know about God, then you just go to the picture God painted for us. You go to the icon, you go to Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God. He is all we need. This is important because there were teachers in Colossae confused about who Jesus was, who Jesus is. They saw him as spirit. In fact, there were some of the Gnostic teachers who taught that Jesus left no footprints when he walked on earth because he was fully flesh. He was, he was not fully flesh. He was fully spirit. He was only spirit and therefore he didn't leave any, any, any footprints anywhere he went. Of course that, that obscures the fact that he ate fish. It obscures the fact that he was suffered at, at the cross, that he was wounded, that all kinds of physical things happened to him. Uh, those, uh, those Gnostic teachers saw, taught that Jesus was wholly good but uh, he was wholly unconnected to the God of the Old Testament. And what the Apostle Paul is trying to tell the believers at Colossae is this, that Jesus is the image, the, the exact representation of the invisible God so that we on earth could comprehend who is God and how he relates. And it's important for us today because people get confused about Jesus even yet today. Today people will say, you know, Jesus was a, was a great man, a great leader of men. Uh, I, I'm going to tell you, Jesus wasn't a great man, a great leader of men. Uh, he was unlike any other. There, every great man you can talk about in, in the world, Jesus is way beyond that. It's not that he was a great man. Uh, some people say he was a great teacher and uh, he taught great things and that's true. But he wasn't a great teacher. He was the image of the invisible God. Uh, he was something far, far more than that. And, and to, uh, to represent him in that manner makes him far less than he really is. You can't compare him to other religions. Jesus is not another religion. He is the one and only. He is not one of the world's great religions. He is the one and only. He is not one way to heaven. He is the one and only way to heaven. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation, this hymn says, the firstborn of all creation. Now this doesn't reference uh, time in the sense that uh, he was the first thing created. He was not created. He before creation, Jesus is. This is not the idea of firstborn as observed in uh, scripture where the firstborn child, the firstborn son has a double portion of the inheritance from the father. No, 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 no. This means that he is preeminent over creation. It means that he was the firstborn and the only begotten of the Father. Before time began, he is. He's the firstborn. Before anything transpired, he is. Before anything's recorded, Jesus is. Before the foundation of the world is laid, Jesus is. This is what we understand from the hymn that Jesus is God come to earth to reveal to us the character and the nature of God and to reveal to us his redemption. He is Lord of creation because be, before creation began, Jesus is, and he is the image of the invisible God. But also he is the very agent of creating all things. 
He is the very agent of creation. Verse 16 says, in him all things were created. In him all things were created. John chapter 1 verse 3 says this, all things came into being through him and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. All things came into being through him. All things were created by him and apart from him nothing was created that has been created. He is the very agent of creation. He was there in, cre in creation. When God said, let us make man in our image, Jesus was present. He was creating everything, visible and invisible. Things in heaven, things on earth. He is the agent of creation. He is the Lord of all creation. He is the shepherd of the stars. He is the Lord of all. All things are in control. His control, it says. All things. In fact, you You'll find this word all consistently throughout this text. In verses 16 and 17, you find all things recorded four distinctive times, four times. And it's said several other times in these short verses. All things, all things, all things, all things are in his control. All things are un under submission to him. He is over thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities, it says here. Thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities. Now there are those are four phrases or four words that were terms that were used in the first century for heavenly beings, the hierarchy of heavenly beings. And one of these is the highest, highest uh, position of heavenly being. And what, what the Apostle Paul is saying is he is over everything that's created here on earth. He is over everything that is created in the universe. And he is over everything that is created in heaven itself. Uh, he has put, the Bible says he has put everything, God has put everything under the feet of Jesus. He is the Lord of creation in a sense he formed it all but also in the very real sense he controls it all. All things are held together by the power and authority of his word. So all things, all things are under his authority. All things are under his direction. There's only one thing that keeps us from a global, global nuclear disaster and that's Jesus. And there's only one thing that keeps us from a global pandemic devastation that destroys and decimates the population of our planet, and that's Jesus. And there's only one thing that ensures that the sun will rise in the morning, and that's Jesus. Because he's an authority over all of creation. He is the Lord of creation. And he is the Lord of redemption, the Lord of the new creation. Verse 18 shifts gears here into the second stanza of this great hymn. Not only is Jesus the Lord of everything that's made and he, and he directs everything that is, but he is the Lord of the redemption. He is the head of the body, verse 18 says. He is the head of the body. In the first century, the, in, in Greek language, the head meant that which would direct, but also would mean that which gave life. The head directed and made decisions, but the head gave life to the body. Jesus is the head of the body. He both directs his church, but he also gives life to his church. He directs and gives direction for his church, and he animates his church with a vitality and a life that is supernatural. The word church appears 114 times in Scripture. It's the Greek word ekklesia, ekklesia. It's used by the Apostle Paul 62 times in his writings. It means those who are called out, those who are the gathering, the assembly, those who are the called of God, those who are the directed by God, those who are in the family of God. And, and this is what he says. He is the head of the body, his church. He is the director and giver of life to those who are his. We who had been alienated, sin sick, lost, without hope, now have the privilege to be the very hands and feet of Jesus. He is the head, the beginning, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. The beginning, the firstborn from the dead, the beginning of a brand new life. Jesus is not only the beginning of life in creation, but he's the beginning of life in the recreation. He's not only the beginning of life in the creation, but he's the beginning of life in, in this reality when we're born again and born to a new life and born to a new way and born to a new walk. 
He is the Lord of this redemption, the Lord of creation. The gospel is the good news that there's a new beginning, a new start, a new day. The glorious news of the gospel is there is a do-over. So Jesus is not the, only the beginning of, of, of life in creation. He's the beginning of new life in recreation. The gospel is the good news that there's a new beginning, a new start, a new day. This is the glorious news of the gospel. We get a do-over. We get a do-over. Now, in, in my life, I, I, uh, I love to play games. I love to play games, uh, and I really love to win games. I love to play games. I love to win games. And every once in a while, when I play with my family and we play some games, uh, sometimes, sometimes we play a game, and I don't know what game we're playing, and I don't I've never played it before and, and you, f you kind of feel your way through it and you get started in that game and you think, man, man, I'd like to start over where, when I know more of the rules and know more of the, more of the uh, strategies about this. I'd like to start this over. <clears throat> Once in a while, my family is so gracious that they let me have a do-over. But God always is so gracious. His mercy endures forever. He grants us a do-over. He is the God of redemption. He is the firstborn of the, the resurrection. He is the Lord of new life, the firstborn from the dead. He brings death to life, sin to forgiveness, lost to found. Jesus died and knew the limitation of death. He knew the separation from God. He cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But the tomb is empty. He's alive. And because he lives, we can live also in him Paul says in him here, the fullness of God dwells, the fullness of deity dwells, the fullness of God. God is fully alive in us and he can be fully active in us and God can be fully present in us, that Christ can be in us through, through the work of the cross. And he reconciles all things unto himself. He reconciles all things unto himself, heaven and earth by the blood of the cross Incredible statements about Jesus. They appear in great poetry form. They appear with lilt and melody and song. And it leads us to a marvelous truth that Jesus, who is Lord of creation, Jesus, who is the Lord of the recreation, the Lord of redemption, can be in us. Now, verse 21 says, and you... And you, it starts with this phrase, and you, and you who were alienated. Our sin causes a great gulf between us and our God. We are the enemies of God. We are without hope in this world apart from the cross. To reject God is to be an enemy of God. To choose self over Savior is to be alienated from God. Some say or think, I'm not an enemy of God. I'm not, I'm not angry at God. I, but God is holy and he is pure. And he is perfect. And anything that is not wholly pure and perfect is separated and alienated from God. Sometimes we are distanced from God and we don't realize. The 1812, the War of 1812, intriguing to me, in the War of 1812 in Belgium, the British and Americans uh, met in Belgium on the 24th of December in 1814 and, and uh, drew up a treaty and signed the conclusion of the war. But the news didn't get back to the U.S. in time. So on January 8th in 2015, the War of New Orleans happened and 2,000 men lost their lives because they just didn't know. And Jesus Christ died on the cross to reconcile us to God so that we might find forgiveness from our sin. And if we're not careful, we don't even realize that great enmity that is within us. Sin separates us. We're hostile. The scripture says we're hostile in our mind and doers of evil deeds. We're hostile in our minds, doers of evil, evil deeds. We're, we're motivated by self, not by God. We're, uh, we work contrary to the plan of God. We hope in our flesh and we do not hope in our God. We are separated, alienated from God. I love the story told of George Whitfield. George Whitfield, an evangelist when the, our nation was young and when it was first, first established. George Whitfield had many distractors, detractors, and uh, one of his detractors wrote him a very nasty letter. In that very nasty letter, he accused him of just some horrible things. And George Whitfield wrote him back a letter. And uh, I, I love his response. He said, listen, listen to what he wrote. He says, I thank you heartily for your letter. As for what you and my other enemies are saying against me, 
I know worse things about myself than you will ever say about me. With love in Christ, George Whitfield. And you know if the truth be told, all of us, if we look at ourselves, know this. Apart from God, we're without hope. Apart from God, our hearts are wicked and rebellious. We're sinful and wretched. We're alienated from God. But this is what He has done. He has reconciled us to, unto Himself. Reconciled. It's a Greek word that means to change from enmity to friendship. That we could be the friend of God. We could be restored and reconciled. Now, periodically in my life, I just do stupid. I wish I didn't do stupid, but I just do. I, I understand it's not required of me. I, I just, things fall off the radar. I just lose track of things. I just don't realize and I just do stupid. And a lot of times when I do stupid, it causes wound and hurt and offense in my bride's life. And I note it and I see it. And if I'm tender, I respond. And sometimes I don't respond very fast. And I have nothing to do but to say, boy, I was way out of line. Would you please forgive me, forgive me and throw myself on the mercy of my bride? But I'm going to tell you, there's nothing so sweet as when you find mercy and you're reconciled and it is well. God always has mercy. His mercy endures forever. In Christ, we find the bridge to the great gulf that separates us from our God. Reconciliation allows us to be presented by Him holy, meaning, meaning seen as righteous, blameless, with no accusation, above reproach. No fault finding here. In Christ, we see ourselves set free from sin, penalty, and power and set on a path to eternally walk in life. Life. Jesus. Paul says, Jesus, He is the Lord of creation and the Lord of a new creation, the Lord of life, the firstborn from the dead, that we might be born again as well. Years ago, uh, years ago, I... Uh, we had shared the gospel with Mike Northrup. Mike Northrup lived outside a town where I was pastoring and we lived in an open country area. And I had knocked on his door many times and he, he was near my age. Uh, uh, this was a number of years ago and the Vietnam War was still, still very, very evident in, in, our, in our minds. And he had served in Vietnam and he said, Paul, uh, I watched men die crying out to Jesus and I watched men die cursing Jesus. And I just don't see that there's any difference. I didn't see any difference. I don't think I need Jesus. And I'd share the gospel and he didn't want to know Jesus and he didn't want to receive Jesus and he didn't find any place for Jesus in his life. And, and I, I'll never forget the day I, I, I went to see Mike and uh, I, I kind of didn't want to, but I just was laid heavy on my heart that evening to go share with Mike. And so I went and knocked on his door to share with him one more time. And as I knocked on that door, he came to the door and he met me at the door and he said, Paul, I'm so glad you're here. Come in here. Get in here now. I need to be saved. And I thought, wow, what happened? And I, and I walked in, shared the simple plan of salvation with him and, and asked him, Mike, what happened? And he said, I was uh, riding my motorcycle into work this morning. He was a route driver for Coca-Cola. He says, I ride my motorcycle into work. I was coming across the Missouri River bottoms. I crested over a hill and, and came right on onto a a deer that was broadside right in front of my motorcycle. And I knew in that moment, in that instant, my, my life was done. And he said, as I came to that deer with nothing to do, all of a sudden that deer, instead of broadside, was right alongside of me parallel. And the handlebar of my, I watched as the handlebars of my, of my bike uh, disturbed the hair of that deer all along that deer. And he said, it was like it was in slow motion. I just watched it. And then as I got to the head of that deer, that deer just looked over at me and looked me in the eye. And he said, and in the eye, I saw the eyes of God. And I heard God give me one chance. And I want to be saved. Now, I wish everyone had a dramatic encounter with God, but everyone doesn't. 
I do know this. If you have an encounter with God, you are changed. From that day forward, it was uh, the next week that Mike began to go with us on evangelistic visits on Tuesday. He was uh, a week old when he uh, first went to share the gospel with someone else because he'd been reconciled to God because our lives are separated, but they can be restored. Jesus is Lord of all. If you have never received Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, I urge you today to trust Him. There will be a phone number on on your screen there. If you've prayed to receive Christ today, if you would text us at this number, uh, we want to give you some materials so that you can grow in Christ and become a true follower of Jesus and one of His true and genuine disciples. Hey, God bless. See you next week. Well, hey, church family, before we end our time in prayer, I do want to remind you next Sunday, May 10th, we will be gathering here for our time of worship. It will also be online, but the times of worship here will be at 9, 11, and then 5 and 7. Let's pray together. Father God, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity we've had this morning to share time in your word and in worship. I pray, Father, that we would take great comfort in knowing that Jesus is Lord of all. He is over all things. Father, I pray that we would uh, aspire to seek after Him in all things. Follow Him in all things. Lord, be with us in this upcoming week. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.